I offer these words in the name of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Our journey through the Easter season moves us deeper into the essence of our belief, the intimate relationship with the force of binding, healing, and reconciling love, which is now open to us through the death and resurrection of Jesus. The image of the Good Shepherd can lull us into comfort, ease, and reassurance that Jesus' love will search us out and that we are worthy of Jesus' laying down of all his life, his hopes, his dreams, his mission, so that we may know of our belovedness by God. Sometimes we need to reside in that place of reassurance, as I did often during seminary. The centerpiece behind the altar of the seminary chapel was a statue of Jesus the Good Shepherd, carrying on his broad shoulders a small lamb, with its ears pressed to Jesus' chest to hear the heartbeat of God, so that we too could be comforted in the knowledge that Jesus' heart held ours, even during the most challenging of times. The image of the Good Shepherd can also startle us into a wakefulness and an active response when we can hear the Good Shepherd's voice beckoning us toward justice. For how could it not be? In our Christian understanding, Jesus reveals the intimacy shared between the person of Jesus and God. God, his Father, the creator of all. In Jesus, there is a seamless revelation of the holy. So if Jesus is the incarnation of all that God is, the source of all truth and hope and joy and beauty and justice, then Jesus could only see each person as good. When he gathered the tax collectors, the prostitutes, the lowly, the oppressed, the impure, into his arms of love, Jesus could only hear the echoes of the words of creation when God said, let us create humankind in our image and proclaim that creation of every individual to be very good. God's justice is recognizing the dignity and beauty of all people. Jesus sought and brought God's sense of justice into the world that God created with an order of righteousness so that all beings could live in abundance, that there would be this web of connection between the created earth humankind and the holy, which would bind us together in a force of love which is beyond our comprehension. We are a part of a web of relationships, which when if one part is broken, or one group of people is lost, or one part of the truth of God is destroyed, it affects us all. The Book of Common Prayer holds the mission of the church to be to restore all people to unity with God and each other in Christ. In Christ, that abiding and powerful force of love which is broader and bigger than Jesus and which was before and will be after all time. Jesus made justice real and tangible as he consistently remembered people, bringing them back into relationship, back into membership with those who had cast them away or had held them to be inferior. Remember the story of the demoniac in Genesaret who asked to follow Jesus after he sent the demons into the pigs? Instead, Jesus sent him back to his community to restore relationships so that the community can heal spiritually the way the man was healed physically. And of course, he sent the healed lepers back, lepers back to the priest to be recognized as purified so that those who marginalized 
and rejected them because of their illness or danger could fully accept them. This is the fullness of healing, restoration, and resurrection. This is what God's justice looks like. And Jesus, with the power of the truth of God set within him, could only speak truth to power, whose source was not of God, which for Jesus, of course, was the Roman Empire, which through Roman identity, financial resources, military power, and violence, infiltrated and broke the system of religious authority that had served, protected, and helped the Jewish people. The system was broken, and Jesus spoke truth to power. This is what God's justice looks like. In our gospel story today, we hear that Jesus laid down his life for God's beloved children. We hear that in each one of us matters so much to God that God would let go of everything, including Jesus' own life, to offer new and abundant life once again to restore our souls and the soul of our world. Now Jesus laid down his life not to submit to worldly power, not to say that the power and authority of this world is a greater force than the power of God, but so that God could redeem even the worst of humanity. Jesus laid down his life for God's beloved people to show the world there is a different and more powerful way which is worth striving for and yearning for and revealing through our hearts and actions in this world, the way of love. Let us be clear, George Floyd did not lay down his life. He did not sacrifice his life for the betterment of humanity, although God may redeem it in such a way that the betterment of humanity rises out of his violent death. No, George Floyd was murdered. Because of what? The color of his skin? The sin of racism? The brokenness in Derek Chauvin's heart? The fear pervading our communities? The reality that many white people fear black people, and many black and brown people fear white people, especially the police. And we know that when fear is the driving force in our hearts, when it is indistinguishable from our very being, we know we are living against the will of God. For God's messenger angels always begin their encounter with the familiar words, do not be afraid. When fear grips our hearts, impenetrable walls are built around the loving parts of our being, which often even God cannot break through. George Floyd did not lay down his life so that we could all embrace a threshold moment and move forward humanity's place on that long arc of God's justice. But it happened. The redemption of his life of our world begins with each of us who hopes for a better world and feel we are one step closer to that dream of God. Redemption begins with the power of Jesus' resurrection which means that in every ending there is a potential new beginning. If and only if we can move into it through our faithfulness, our willingness to look at our own hearts, our own self-examination, our own repentance, and our own discernment of how are we going to live out this call to God's justice, which is heard in the beckoning of Jesus' voice. In order to move into the commencement, as some people are calling this verdict, the beginning of a new era where hope can flourish. We must engage in hard work, deep and difficult conversations, and remember that the peace we are all hardwired to find in our lives comes only as we restore relationships as Jesus did in our story last week as he entered the upper room of the disciples and said, peace be with you. Several of you have asked how I answered that young Jewish girl who asked me bluntly, 
who killed Jesus? Many of you have offered a response which I believe is right. We all did. All of us who harbor anything but pure love in our hearts. All of us who refuse to banish greed and pride and prejudice from our souls. Who killed George Floyd? I'll let you find the answer that is right in your heart. As we ponder this threshold time in our nation's history, as we see a new inbreaking of God's justice inaugurated by Tuesday's verdict, I return to my core belief that in Jesus' death and resurrection, that all things, all people, all situations can come to wholeness in life and or in death. This can involve restoring one's individual relationship with God, which happens multiple times throughout our lives. It can also happen in someone's death. I believe that God has made George Floyd's soul pure, whole, and true to how God has always seen him as one of God's beloved. I also believe God is at work making Derek Chauvin's soul pure, whole and true to how God always sees him as one of God's beloved. When I saw Chauvin's eyes darting about during the conviction, I was wondering what he might be looking for. Compassion? Mercy? Leniency? Or was that a look of complete disbelief? that the broken system that had informed and formed him was crumbling before his very eyes. This individual restoration of one's relationship with God in life and or in death can also have a collective implication. For let us remember the power of God. There is no thing, no one, no system of oppression, that is beyond God's redemption. And yet we have a part to play in that grace of redemption. We need to listen attentively for the Good Shepherd's voice, whispering in our ears, screaming to our hearts, imploring our souls to be a part of the next era where we let justice will roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. On the night the verdict was read, justice for me was in the tears rolling down my face. I felt a huge sense of holiness, a presence of God's truth, and I was profoundly saddened. There is so much I lament in this situation, and much I find is still bubbling up. But in this moment, I lament that there are so many good and faithful police officers who join the force to serve and protect their fellow citizens who must be demoralized by the brokenness of one of their own being witnessed to by the whole world. I lament that we may be anti-racist and yet still be caught in the systemic racism which pervades our world. I lament that George Floyd is not at home with his family right now. I lament what must be the unbearable grief of Derek Chauvin. My heart aches for so much. I imagine yours does too. And there is much I imagine God laments, among many other things, that on Mother Betsy's Facebook post after the verdict, she writes, I pray that this verdict is the ship turning, but I must also pray, Lord, help my unbelief. And there is much I am willing to lay down my life for, hopefully not my actual life, but not everyone gets that choice. I can release all things except the love of God. For when my hands are open, when my heart is pure, when my soul is uncluttered of what the world has taught me 
about the capacity of human ugliness, then and only then can I hear Jesus' voice calling me, calling us, calling our nation, calling our world to act, to be righteous and just. Sometimes it feels a bit like Jesus is leading me into dangerous parts of my soul. For this is really hard work. And sometimes I need the reminder that, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me. Because that means wherever Jesus is with us, in every ending, there is the possibility of a new life. It is the deepest order of this created world, which means that's how you and I have been created, with an eye and a heart toward bringing in newness and abundance for all, for that is what God's justice looks like. The last line of Psalm 23 is very familiar. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. That's very comforting. But what if our hearts could respond by saying, yes, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, but let me lead with it. Lead with goodness and mercy for all. Amen.